So Jason, Jason Alderman, it's nice to get to chat with you a little bit about your relationship to the Museum Computer Network, or what we now refer to as MCN, and its 50th year. You're, uh, in my opinion, relatively new to the museum field. How long have you been in the museum field, and, and, and what got you here? I've only been in the museum field for about two and a half years, and I started out as an interaction designer and user experience designer working on uh, enterprise software for big Fortune 500 companies. And I really wanted to get into things that were involving the intersection of digital and physical design. Uh, there was a lot of movement towards the Internet of Things and, and a lot of the industrial design, product design kind of uh, as, as a trend within our industry. But it didn't seem like a lot of the clients, the big clients that we had, wanted to get into that. And so I started looking to outside industries and uh, went to a lot of conferences for all sorts of different domains. And one of the, the conferences that I went to was Nina Simon put on a museum camp at the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz. And the theme of the museum camp was hack the museum. And so they brought in a bunch of exhibit design experts and gave workshops on how to design exhibits and then brought out 20 artifacts that were in the archives of the museum that had never seen the light of day, um, or at least not in publicly in the museum. And we had to team up in groups of around four or five and, and put together a, an exhibit around those artifacts. And uh, honestly, <laughs> it didn't go quite as planned as you would expect for a, a hackathon of a really quick uh, exhibit design. And we, we had a lot of pitfalls, and um, but it was a really fun experience overall. And I loved the, the staff at the museum there. And so that kind of put the, the wheels in motion that I had saved up a bunch of money over the next few months and quit my job to try to break into museums. And then I was lucky enough to meet uh, Chad Weinert when he was coming to Balboa Park. And through him, his boss, Nick Honeyset, and was able to work my way into a job with uh, as a contractor with Balboa Park Online Collaborative. Right, right. And I think that's how I first met you was, was through uh, our mutual friend, Chad, who also has some great vision in the museum field. He is a wonderful person. <laughs> So you found the place where you could really apply yourself in, in the museum sector. Uh, where did your connection to MCN come from? I think I probably heard about it from Chad. There were a bunch of people in our office who were excited about MCN and giving talks. And I, I was big into going to conferences just as a way to, to learn about the profession and also to meet other people and connect. And MCN was touted as one of the, the two big conferences uh, with museums and the web that dealt with museums and technology. But I was told, I forget by whom, that MCN would probably be more my speed because it was where they got really geeky and talked about the nerdy details of building things. And so I was not disappointed. Uh, my first MCN yeah. was in Minneapolis in, uh, what was that, 2015? And... I presented on some work that we did with the Model Railroad Museum and got into all the, the weeds of the details of what we had learned about using Raspberry Pis in, in a production situation. And it was a lot of fun and a great community. Raspberry Pis. Well, we'll, we're, we'll, we'll have to talk about your, your, your favorite flavor of pies a little <laughs> bit later. Yeah, we're, we're all about pies. Um, where do you see that uh, MCN has, has, what niche is it now filled in, in your way of working and uh, your professional life? The people at MCN are utterly fantastic. I, I think just the connection that you have, first of all, sorry, let me backtrack. Uh, first of all, I think MCN is a phenomenal conference in keeping uh, both the academic side of things, of, of exploring new territories, but also keeping the in the trenches kind of industry perspective of these are the pitfalls and the the things that we ran into and also the 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 possibilities that we ran into when exploring new technologies in our museums and everyone is extremely open and sharing about their experiences and really encourages each other to build on uh, the experiences that they've had. And having gone only for a few years now, um, I went in 2015, 2016, and hoping to go in 2017, it feels like you can see a progression as museums build off of the knowledge that they've shared. 
from year to year. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, one of the things that I love about MCN is, is just how it, it's it's a very agile organization. And it well, I think it's really grown to be an agile organization after learning some lessons itself along the way. And it's now to the point where it can really respond to you know to people like yourself who are coming in and looking at new and innovative ways to do things and um, it's not just locked into one particular vehicle for how we're using technology uh, in the cultural sector so you work independently I, I mean you haven't you haven't really formally worked for a museum up until now and you're still you're fu- still functioning independently how is it working that way i think you know a lot of people that are involved in mcn have an institutional affiliation and and uh, you've come in as an independent and and remained that way how's that, how's that going for you but to say that i work independently is a little bit of a misnomer because every project i'm working with people on the staff at the museum and working closely with them so in a way it's it's been a lot of fun and there's never any opportunity to get bored or or to kind of stagnate because you're constantly learning something new you're constantly learning about the business of a new museum and and then working really closely trying to embed with the people at the museum to make something wonderful for them do you feel like mcn plays a a role when you're working independently like that is there any type of support network or that you're getting from mcn MCN has definitely been helpful in that regard. I know in the early days it started out as a network of people who were talking about computer use in museums in New York in the 1960s, from what I understand, and then it kind of evolved into a mailing list, and then it evolved into a conference. But the conference has kind of evolved back into that thing that it started as, where it's people helping people and asking for advice. And, and I find that aspect of it really, really useful. Uh, I know that we have a Slack that's not really so well used, but uh, I will still email and ping uh, colleagues and friends that I've met at the conference to get their help. For one example is that I was working on a, another project recently for the Museum of Art and History. Um, the museum that actually kind of got me into this field uh, was working with a glass sculptor named Biagio Scarpello who uh, was building an interactive donation machine in their lobby. And I was helping with the electronics on that. And for that, I was using uh, an Arduino shield and satellite kit from Miriam Langer at, and her team at New Mexico Highlands University called Museduino. And this kit is phenomenal. But even before I started using the kit, I was pinging Miriam, who I met at MCN in 2015, for advice on how to do things and just informally um, getting a lot of, of, of wisdom and mentorship uh, from her and her team. So in that respect, just having a network of people that you can use no matter what domain you're, you're going into, because if we're doing this right, technology is always changing and we constantly have to learn about what the newer technologies are. And so having expertise and, and knowing who to go to, to, to talk to about that has been extremely helpful. That's a great segue to my, really my kind of next question for you is about what some of your favorite projects are that you've worked on, especially looking at your interest in these open source hardware platforms and, and some of the more innovative stuff you've done. Do you, do you have a particular project you'd like to share? Ooh, <laughs> tough question. Um, I, I think that recent project, which I think has pretty much um, been released uh, in in the lobby of the Museum of Art and History in Santa Cruz. There's uh, a new project called Take Sale, and it's a donation machine where uh, children or patrons can walk up and wave a dollar bill under the mouth of this, this nozzle, and it turns on a dust collector, which is about four times more powerful than a shop vac, and it suctions up the dollar bill into a big glass dome where the dollar bills spin around. And as it passes into the dome, it triggers sensors that will light up and inflate with box fans, these giant ship sails that are on the wall. And all the electronics are run by an Arduino. And we got to learn a lot about uh, how to control some big, some big switches and relays to, to make all of that work. And so that was a tremendously fun and educational project. I uh, look forward to doing more electronics work on that. But I'd say my second or other favorite project, I don't want to pick favorites, is 
uh, one of my early projects that I worked on with uh, with Chad Weinert and uh, Brinker Ferguson at the Model Railroad Museum here in Balboa Park and with the whole the staff and the team there, Anthony and Polly and folks. And what we did is we rigged up a bunch of iPads and had a quiz that you would take on the iPad about the history of the park. And then it would light up and play sounds on a scale model of buildings in the park from 1915 when the park had its, its grand opening as part of the Panama Pacific Expo. I can't remember. It's always, there were, there were two expositions that year, the Panama California Expo and the Panama Pacific Exposition. And I get them confused. But anyway, we ran those iPads we connected them to Raspberry Pis that were running a Node.js server, and there were a lot of moving parts and things that were triggering this, and it was it was very complicated, but it was uh, we we learned a lot. It was great. What role do you play in these projects, Jason? Are you actually doing everything from the conceptualization to the coding to the the physical installation, or how does your role usually play out? I. I'm trying to think of a way to answer that that's not just yes. <laughs> um, but uh, yes, I um, my background traditionally is in design, and I started out as an interaction designer, as I mentioned, um, user experience designer, where you're kind of sketching out and figuring out how something will behave and working closely with the developers who are building it so that they know how that works. And while I was doing that, I was learning visual design, apprenticing under some other designers who are really, really good at that, and also development by working with some developers and kind of figuring things out as I go and learning best practices. And now working with museums, it's kind of, it's both a, um, a blessing and a curse because if, if you're good at something, the reward for that is doing more of that thing. And so I'm just good enough at design and development that it's a little bit economical, I guess, to, to have me do everything. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I, I try to draw the line at, at project management, and it's usually good to have somebody else there who's telling you what the priorities are, because when you're switching so many hats, it's... It can be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> so I'm, I'm guessing that our listeners would probably like to get a glimpse of these projects. And uh, while they might be able to travel uh, to these locations, is there a YouTube documentation or a photo documentation online that we could embed a URL here someplace? Um, I will see if I can get that to you after we talk, but uh, yes, there should be. And there's a full MCN presentation on everything that we learned about the Model Railroad project. The other project in the Museum of Art and History is, uh, I'm still putting together the documentation on that, but I'll, I'll send it to you. Cool, cool. Yeah, that's one of the great things about MCN is, is we generate a lot of good documentation with these projects, and uh, you, and, you and Chad have, have definitely done a great job on that. It really makes a good excuse to put together uh, all of your lessons learned after a project and kind of put a bow on it. Uh, a lot of times you're, you're just running, running, running from project to project and without that kind of impetus to put everything together and package what you learned, sometimes the projects just get orphaned or <laughs> go undocumented. Right. So it's nice to, nice to have MCN for, for that other motivator. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So ever since I first met you, I've, I've gotten to know you as, as relatively quiet, but then after I get to understand what you're up to, I, I see you very much as, as, as a quiet disruptor uh, and you know, often really kind of challenging some of the entrenched practices in the field and uh, looking at new ways to to solve problems and, and I think even more so to really engage our visitors. What is it that you think brought you to, to play that role? Well, I'm, I'm flattered that you think that, <laughs> first of all. Um, I, I think it's our role as designers and museum technologists to question assumptions, uh, first and foremost. Uh, we uh, are brought in to make things interactive and make things more engaging. And, and sometimes people will have a certain opinion about where that should go. 
But in the process of designing these things and coming up with these things, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and tell a story about working in design consultancy for enterprise software. We would work with these large organizations, and sometimes the projects that we worked on would take years and years, and we would come up with new ways to improve not just their software, but their process in the process of developing this software. And somebody once told me, and I'm, I can't remember who told me this, and I've been trying to, to find the source of it for a while, but they said that software design is organizational change. You're not just redesigning how the, the outward appearance of things, or you're not just redesigning a product, you're kind of helping a company or an organization learn how to do their own business better. I don't want to say that that means that the consultant or the designer or the museum technologist is by any means a, a guru who just magically can come in and make everything better. But a lot of times in the process of bringing in an outside consultant or a museum technologist, they're helping the organization itself question how it's done things and if the way that it's done things is the way that it should be done. Because there's always a lot of inertia to keep doing things the way it's been done because that's the way it has been done. So in that respect, I think that, that museum technologists are very helpful in this profession in, in kind of forcing us to think, is this the best way to do it? And maybe we can do it a better way for cheaper in a way that's more engaging uh, and in a way that uses some newer technologies in, in some uh, a way that's fun. Mm -hmm. You also seem to really not just look at new technologies, but look at stepping away from relying upon technologies that that have become ubiquitous in museums for instance i know from from, from i know where you're going from with talking this. <laughs> from talking to you in the past i know that you know touch screens well you still see a a, a role for them uh, are a, a little bit of a sore spot for you and that that most museums just default to that being a portal for information and 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 you look well beyond that do you have anything more to so, add to that? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have plenty more to add, but I'll try to, to keep it short. Um, there's a, a technologist in the Bay Area named Brett Victor. He used to work for Apple, and he had a, a blog post, you can look it up online, called A Brief Rant on Interaction Design. And he decried the fact that so many designers were building products that were essentially under touchscreens. They were manipulating pictures under glass. And he showed all these photographs of what human hands can do. And there, there's so many more uses and intuitive ways that we can manipulate things than, than just touching a touch screen. And so this has been a little bit of a soapbox of mine is that a lot of times museums will buy fancy touch screens or new technologies, and then they'll go looking for ways to use them. And I can completely understand the need for museums to recoup on their investments. But there's some things where you could do something for a whole lot cheaper, both in the development and the creation of, of the technology, but also create something that's a lot more engaging to your audiences and your visitors than, than just having a, a touchscreen. Right. But don't you think part of that is, is just that a touch screen for a museum technologist is a known quantity that they can basically take and talk about and sell it because it takes a form that people are already familiar with. And the type of work that you do is much more complicated and the form it's going to take, the, you know, the footprint in the museum, the, the required infrastructure to support it the staff that is going to take to support it and the type of training can be more challenging when you're looking at something that's outside of the box and more ambitious like the types of projects that you take on. I'm going to take a little bit of a devil's advocate there and, uh, and, and I'll caveat this by saying that I am not extremely confident about what I'm saying here, but I feel like in some respects museums have a great deal of experience in building interactives that don't have electronics in them, that don't necessarily have screens in them, that aren't pictures under glass. They, they have experience in making tangible things that people can manipulate that are very simple. 
And I feel like a lot of museums forget about that sometimes in trying to integrate technology into their exhibits. And so they leap to touchscreens because that seems to be something that is, it is, it has technology embedded in it. It is technology, but there's a lot of institutional knowledge in building interactives that don't have electronics that could be augmented ever so slightly with electronics in ways that do not require a tremendous investment in maintenance and understanding how uh, how they work. Um, there, there are a lot of off-the-shelf open source hardware kits like Arduinos and Raspberry Pis that have tremendous amount of documentation. Some of them have modular pieces that you could plug in for the various things that you want to augment these interactives with. And, and I feel in that respect that, that touch screens get a little bit too much attention and things that are more in the wheelhouse of museums already get a little bit of a short shrift. And so I don't want us to forget the history that museums have with building interactives that are extremely engaging and very tangible and multi-sensory and really appeal to a wide range of visitors and are very inclusive. And and I and I totally get that. And at the same time, I, I want to challenge you there, but but Please do. in in, a, in a, <laughs> well in a, in, a, in a way to I think challenge the field, which is you know I'm coming at and and have been involved in most of the technology work that I've done over my career uh, from the art museum perspective, and I would say in general when it comes to exhibit design, we're very set in our ways. And putting a kiosk or a touch screen on the wall, or even better, uh, having our visitor pull out their own mobile phone is, uh, is a much safer and uh, controlled practice versus when we start to talk about making the environment itself uh, a part of the interactivity and in the exhibit. And so I love what you're saying. But at the same time, I no, think I, I think when you cross that boundary from a, a, a science museum or a technology museum to a history museum to even more regulated a, a traditional art museum, all of a sudden there's these there's barriers to adopting this kind of agile process that, that is a part of your practice. Uh, there's two things that you brought up there that I want to address. First of all, um, I agree with you and. And, and I think that there are a lot of challenges that we have to, to find here, because if we want to get buy-in from the, the people at the, the top of the museum, we need to find ways to measure these and, and to show that there is some kind of measurable benefit um, for doing things in the ways that I'm advocating. Uh, touch screens, as you said, are, are easier to sell because they've been used and there are ways to, to show the level of engagement with them. And a lot of the kind of bespoke opportunities that I think that there are, are, are kind of harder to sell because there's not as much of a, a literature and a history of, of how well these do. But the second point that I wanted to bring up is that what you're talking about getting museums engaged with a kind of agile uh, request for proposals process is exactly the topic of um, the MCN session that Chad Weinard and Emily Kotecki of the North Carolina Museum of Art and I are going to be giving at MCN 2017. We just got the go ahead, the green light on that. So perfect. Um, really excited to explore that uh, collaboratively with the attendees at MCN 2017 and, and see if we can work together some best practices for how to get museums on board with a more agile design process for especially for art museums when you're going for something and you're pitching something with a little bit of a feeling but you're not really sure where the end result of this interactive is going to be or where this this museum technology is going to take you that's 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 awesome i'm, I'm glad we we get a plug in to our to our <laughs> interview for well for, for for why you should attend the conference this coming year as well as as its connection to your work and your perspective and and for those of you who haven't uh met jason uh, an opportunity to, to to see him in real life uh so jason this has been a great conversation i i don't want to conclude without having uh collecting your thoughts a little bit about uh, mcn and now celebrating our 50th 
anniversary. Do you have some ideas as to where you'd like to see the organization go and, and grow into uh, in the future, fitting with your vision of, of what the field could use? I think that there's a lot of potential for MCN to help establish best practices and code libraries um, for a lot of the more imaginative museum technology that we were discussing. Uh, I know that a lot of institutions, a lot of people who participate in the MCN community have have already put a lot of their work up on GitHub. And, and so there's a lot of examples to draw from, but I, I feel like there's a lot of the knowledge that is shared at the conferences that could be turned into something that's a little bit more actionable. Uh, and, and I feel like that's the direction that that a lot of these things are taking and we'll get there, but uh, the, there's a tremendous opportunity for a resource that taps into all the historical knowledge that the community has. On top of that, I think that it might be interesting to see what might happen if there were local chapters of MCN. I don't know if this is already a thing. If it is, correct me. Um, but uh, another professional organization that I'm a part of, the Interaction Design Association, IXDA, has chapters in cities all over the world. And they're usually regular weekly or monthly meetups that kind of keep that interest alive in between the annual conferences. And connect people in the the same way that the mission of MCN is to connect people in, in a way throughout the year and not just at the, the annual meetups. I, I couldn't agree more. I, there's definitely some efforts underway and, and, you know, the drinking in museums, which wasn't wasn't re- yeah. wasn't really uh, <laughs> or drinking. Is it drinking about museums? Uh, yeah, drinking about museums. <laughs> drinking in museums. I like drinking in museums better. But if you have to drink about museums, those were started by Coven outside of MCN, but they've, I think, really have started to grow into that type of, you know, meetup. There's definitely, from those meetups, growing interest in having, you know, at least regional gatherings, as you're saying. I, I do think that that's one of the, the challenges with the organization and certainly the board has talked about this at length is how to break away from MCN playing a a once a year community gathering function how to really make MCN a 24-7 365 organization that serves you know especially people who are at small museums who don't have the budget uh, and can't afford even if they did have the budget can't afford to get away long enough to go to a four-day conference so how do you get that out out to them so i share that desire and i have feeling that as an organization (laughs) we're going to get there hopefully you'll become more involved in that i feel like that's the way that mcn is is probably going to go but i my crystal ball is a little bit foggy Signs point to yes. <laughs> Signs point to yes. Now, we need you to uh, use your innovative uh, take on and technology as to how technology can, can play a role in uh, making that become the reality for MCN. So I, I just want to thank you for your time. Is there anything you wanted to add? I just want to thank you, Scott. Um, I'm extremely honored and flattered to be interviewed by you. And I wanted to thank you for, for your mentorship uh, outside of this interview. <laughs> It's my pleasure. I look forward to seeing you in Pittsburgh. I am really looking forward to Pittsburgh. Nice chatting with you. Take care.